Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome back to this lecture number 6 on the series on human behavior. Now, as I keep on doing on every lecture, we will detail a little bit of where we started and then after we do that, I will go back into what we did in the last lecture for the sake of continuity. So, we started off by uh, explaining what is human behavior and there I uh, explained to you how human behavior corresponds to the idea of what is psychology. And then I kept on telling you why is the need of study of psychology and there I explained to you that psychology is to be studied because it is a science which tells you about human beings, which tells you about why human beings do what they do. So, basically psychology is a science of not only human behavior, but also of mental processes which are responsible for this human behavior. That is the technical definition. After that, we outline on to what is the history of psychology or the history of study of human behavior. And there I brought to you the idea that psychology came up from uh, philosophy and from the physical uh, sciences. So, how these uh, philosophers thought about what the soul was, what the mind was, what the brain was and uh, not the brain, brain is a recent manifestation. So, the idea of how the soul and the mind interacts and, and makes you do certain things or how people do certain things. So, right from the idea of dualism to uh, to empiricism and those kind of thoughts where people believe the idea that sometimes uh, human beings are born with certain abilities and at other times believing that they are uh, uh, develop these abilities from uh, the interactions that they have in this world. So, these are the philosophical questions and then uh, on the other hand we had uh, physiological questions uh, or uh, the physiological sciences which try to look at how human beings were composed of and how human beings did what they did right from the study of nerve impulses to the study of uh, how the brains transmit information between the two uh, hemispheres and that was what how psychology actually uh, the science of psychology actually developed from uh, philosophy and uh, the physiology. Then we looked at some schools of psychology and so very quickly I will detail what are the schools. So, we had schools like structuralism which were which had people coming from the basic sciences and they believed that the study of psychology can be done in terms of breaking the behavior into its constraints part. And these parts could be the both the physical and the psychological. So, that is how uh, they looked at. Then we had a functionalism which believed that psychology uh, study requires to, to actually evaluate the behavior to see the behavior when in process. So, when the behavior is happening you look at it and only then you will understand why do human beings do what they do and how they do it that kind of a thing. Two primitive schools which both opposing each other. And then we had finally the gestalt school which actually looked at psychology in terms of the whole and the part. And what the Gestalt school uh, came up with, the idea that they came up with was that the psychological behavior in totality was entirely different than the constituent parts of the behavior and it was a direct opposition to what the structuralists said. These were uh, some of the early schools. And after this, a revolution took up in the whole idea of psychology, in the whole science of psychology, came in the school of behaviorism which said that human behavior has nothing to do with cognition, nothing to do with the mind, soul and that kind of a thing. Human behavior is a stimulus and a response kind of an interaction. So, people do something because something makes them do that particular thing and act is basically defined by some en environmental stimuli. So, it is a stimulus response kind of a thing. So, it is basically mechanical in nature and so each response can be mapped back to its particular stimulus and so people's behavior can be mapped, mapped back to certain situation events people or things like that. After behaviorism came the idea of cognitivism then uh, which believed that the human beings had 
the, the behavior of human beings is explained by the uh, working of the mind which, uh, which in its uh, thought process, thinking, decision making and so on and so forth makes the behavior happen. So, it is not stimulus response, there is an organism in between, there is human thought process in between which makes the behavior happen. Then was the school of uh, psychoanalysis which believed that human behavior was actually coming out of uh, unconscious drives or unconscious hidden drives and that drove the human behavior. So, that is how we detailed uh, the, the basic schools and further to that we explain different kinds of uh, approaches from cognitive neuroscience to the idea of psycholinguistics and how these schools or these uh, areas uh, came in to occupying the idea about psychology. The later half of the lecture, uh, the introductory lecture, we looked at various methods of doing psychology. So, right, right on from experimentation to the idea of what uh, correlation is all about and uh, detailing on to other methods like the survey method, observation. Uh, and then uh, correlational study, uh, literature review, these kind of uh, study or these kind of uh, methodologies or tools to study the human behavior. So, that was the first part. Now, uh, after that we looked at uh, the, uh, a lecture on sensation where we looked at how the physical environment gets converted into the psychological environment and uh, or psycho uh, physical stimulus gets con converted into something which is psychological in nature. And there we looked at concepts like absolute threshold which is basically the minimum stimulus which is required for uh, the human systems or human uh, receptors or human sense organs to uh, basically record it. And we also looked at the concept of differential threshold which basically says that what is the minimum change which is required for human beings to detect uh, differences between two levels of a stimulus. And so, why these are necessary? So, we looked at the, uh, the questions of sensitivity and sensory coding. And so, why these are necessary? Because these are necessary because sensation is the process through which the physical envi uh, envi uh, environmental stimuli gets converted into psychological stimuli. Sensation encodes physical stimuluses. Now, what is the reason why we need to study sensation? Because it is an it's a interesting process, it is a very interesting process because uh, physical things like uh, temperature, pressure or uh, photons in the in the, in, in, uh, in the environment, they get converted into uh, uh, psychological factor, psychological meaning. For example, the idea of cold and hot comes from the rise in fall of temperature. So, how this cold and hot is to be mapped on to uh, degree Celsius, increase in degree Celsius and decrease in degree Celsius that is what sensation is all about. So, we looked at the concepts of how these really work and in terms of Weber's law, uh, Fechner's law and, and uh, uh, concepts like signal detection theory. So, what was the need of signal detection theory? Signal detection basically what signal detection theory actually does is it looks at how people uh, detect or how pe how good people are in detecting signals from noise what do i mean by that so how people uh, uh, how good people are in detecting any kind of presence of physical stimuluses and so what is the reason for looking at that the reason is that people are not good at detecting the presence of uh, uh, physical stimuluses one reason being that the brain itself creates a lot of noise and in, in in the background of that noise detecting something in the external environment becomes really difficult and so the idea of single detection theory was created which basically gives us the precise sensitivity of any physical uh, or any psychological system or any psychological uh, organ uh, sense organ for that matter. So, uh, that is how uh, we, uh, we we looked at in, in that particular uh, part of sensation. And towards the end of uh, that lecture, we looked at, we took a classic system which is the human eye and we studied the human eye of how it uh, it makes color, how it makes uh, perception, uh, um, I am sorry, uh, how, how, does it, how does it encode stimulus, how does it make image, how does it encode image and how does it ima uh, encode anything. Uh, which is uh, out there in the external environment and, and, and uh, how does it create uh, things like contrast, uh, hue, sensation. Also, we looked at how the human eye is composed of and what are the various parts of it. So, that was what sensation was all about. It was basically uh, a section which dealt with uh, sensory organs and how the sensory organs work. Now, once the sensory organs take in information, uh, this information is converted into a meaningful input, right. So, uh, when a temperature goes down, you call it 
being cold but when the temperature goes up you called it hot. So, these names of what hot and cold are or what sweet and bitter is or what liking and unliking is or any of these for that matter any of these psychological constructs or psychological words how do they come about or when you see uh, a structure which is brown in color at the base and uh, green in color at the top you call it a tree. So, how do you distinguish a tree from a clown uh, that 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 all is composed of in perception. So, the next section we dealt with perception. So, last class was the introductory class uh, of perception where we looked at what is perception, what is the need of it, what, why do we need perception and so we identified certain uh, facts why perception is needed. One of the fact being that we human beings interact, they manipulate in the environment, they deal with the environment and so all kind of uh, uh, all kind of interactions that the human beings do with the environment that may be the reason why perception is important. And so, what is perception? It is making meaning, meaning of the external stimulus uh, which is encoded by the sensation. So, as the sensation encodes certain certain uh, physical stimuluses into the psychological regime, how the psychological uh, regime makes meaning out of it is what is uh, the idea of perception. So, making meaning of physical stimuluses is perception. Then we started off by looking at five different functions of perception, how does perception really start. And the first step in any perception is attention. So, we focused on what is attention. So, what is attention? Attention is a process through which we decide to encode what stimuluses are uh, processed and what stimuluses are not processed. And it is akin to uh, the sieve that we have in the house uh, through which we filter the tea. So, it is a kind of a filter which decides which stimuluses you will pay attention to and which stimuluses you would not pay attention to. So, that is attention and then we looked at how the, there are concepts of sustained attention and the concept of how attention uh, there is a concept of divided attention. So, we will focus on those things. We also looked at how attention really works in terms of reading. For example, how does the eye actually read and what is the role of attention in reading. So, uh, just uh, as uh, the eye keeps on bouncing from one stimulus to another in terms of sarcards and, and fixations, how does the eye go on uh, go ahead and uh, make this reading. So, that was one part of it and then the second, so there are five steps in perception, the first part being attention, the second part was localization, which is basically finding out where the external stimulus is in the uh, environment, where exactly is the stimulus in the environment. And so, uh, that was uh, what uh, what we were doing and so there what, what we actually did was we looked at uh, how this localization process happens. And so, the localization process in, in terms of looking at the localization process there are several steps to it uh, right from looking at uh, identifying what are the backgrounds and foregrounds to using the gestalt principle which says that how things are combined together to looking at how does the eye actually makes distance. So, how does the eye uh, makes distance or identifies distance and it does through two processes one being the monocular cue the other being the minocular cue. So, how does the eye use these type of cues and makes distances or 3D perception. So, that is what localization is all about and further to it we also looked at how does the eye create motions. So, I did not detail too much on two motion, but then the, the idea of having the two eye is to perceive uh, motion and so how does this uh, uh, stereoscopic motion which is the artificial motion that you have and all other kinds of motion uh, are actually generated and that is where we signed off in the last lecture. Today what we will do is we will add on to what we learned in the last lecture. So, we will look at the three other processes in perception. So, the first step in perception is paying attention of what stimulus has to be encoded and what stimulus does not have to be encoded and the second step being localization of uh, the stimulus in the external environment or localization uh, uh, of the object of interest in the uh, external environment. The third step once you are able to identify the object in the external environment, the third step starts which is called recognition and recognition is a process through which people recognize or through people identify stimuluses in the external environment. So, recognition is very important. Why is it important? Suppose you are walking somewhere and a cat comes in and cross a white cat crosses your uh, path. Now, it is very important for you to identify you have localized first of all you have paid attention because the cat came in quickly and it cut your path. So, that you paid attention to it and then you did localize that there is an external object which is crossing your path. The third step has to be very important 
what why it is important if you are not able to identify the cat as a cat, but you identify the cat as a hula loop or something else which is a white color maybe a paper or a plastic bag which is flying in front of you in the paper uh, in, in, in front of you and it goes through it. And if you identify it as a plastic bag you may step on it, but then if you identify it as a cat you may not step on it or you would basically take your uh, leg back. So, basically these decisions of what to do and what not to do in the external environment or how to interact with the objects in the external environment requires you to uh, go through the process of recognition. So, recognition is a process through which we identify or we make meaning or we uh, understand what is the object which is in the external environment which has been localized. So, let us let us start with what is recognition. So, basically recognizing an object, recognizing of an object it starts with several sub problems right. The there are certain steps of recognizing an object any object in the external environment there are several, several st steps to it. We will try and unfold of how recognition really happens. So, as I said it is not an easy job to recognize an object it requires you not to just to identify an object, but also compare it with a template or a prototype which has been stored into your uh, into your head. But let us not get in there and, st and, and actually look at how does uh, the recognition of an object actually starts uh, with or actually starts uh, over. The first step into any recognition, uh, recognition to happen is to identify the primitive bits and pieces of information and the second step is how to combine these bits and pieces into a whole. What do I mean by this? Through sensation we get information like color, like angle, like curves and this kind of information. So, basic primitive information is what the sensory systems actually sends to the perceptual system right. So, what the sensation actually does or the sensory organs or the eye in this case sends to, to the brain is information about color, information about depth, information about what is the boundary. So, where where is the figure and where is the boundary that kind of thing, how many angles are there, how many curves are there, this kind of shape orientation these are the information that the sensory organs are sending to the brain. What the brain has to do is to take this information and combine them together to make the meaning. So, basically perception uh, or recognition is a two part process. The first step is to basically uh, take this information together, collect this information from the sensory organs and, and do a binding with it and the second step is to once these things are binded together how to make the whole. So, if you have primary information how do you bind them together, how do you integrate them together. For example, you have, you have color, if you have orientation, if you have angle, if you have uh, um, certain other information uh, for example, height how do they combine all these information together first of all to make a whole and once you make that whole, once you make a picture out of it how do you identify this picture to be a clown and not to be a uh, tree or how do you identify this picture to be a tree and not to be a clown. So, two step process one step in recognition starts with basically taking in primary informations primitive informations from the sensory organs and then uh, mixing them together or combining and making a whole lot of it which is called the binding problem and the second problem is to recognize these objects. Now, even before we do this there is one more step to it recognition of object is basically uh, is, is not an easy job right and so it happens through something called the global versus local processing. So, recognition starts by global versus local processing. What is the meaning of it? Any object which is recognized has to be in some context right and for example, look at this. I have made a shape here. Not very good shape, but this is what the shape looks like. So, what is this? What is this shape looks like? Now, given the fact that if this shape is in, in the background of a house if this is my house and if this shape is in the background of a house it looks like more or less like a mailbox. So, if it this shape falls in the foreground of a house it looks like a, ma a mailbox, but the same shape when it falls 
in front of a kitchen like thing in, in, in the front of a background which looks appears to be like a kitchen this appears to be a bread. So, the idea that the same shape can be both a mailbox and a bread depends on the context and this is what is global versus local processing. What does it mean? When making interpretations about object, the important thing is that the first step is th that human beings not only use uh, the global information which is the scene in which this information is, they also use something called local information. So, before interpreting what this object is, human beings actually look at the scene in which this object is and the scene provides a lot of information about what the object has to be or what the object tends to be. So, this is uh, basically a combination of two processes which is called top down processing and bottom up processing. Context which is where this object is will provide us a clue or answer to what the object can be and this is called top down processing. What is the meaning of top down processing? When your memories, your past experiences help you into identifying an object. This is called top down process because what happens is your memory gives you a clue to what an object is. Bottom up processes are processes in which you uh, look at the object itself or parts of the object itself and from there you construct the meaning of the object. So, when you when you are making interpretations in terms of the object itself or recognizing an object based on features of the object this is called the uh, bottom up process. But when you are using your past experiences and based on that you are trying to identify what an object is this is called the top down process. And so, it, in recognition both these processes work to, uh, together. It starts with recognition of an object starts with a goal processing where we look at where the object of interest is, where it is, in, on what background it is and based on the information from memory we then predict what can be the object. So, that is what one of the things are. So, reco recognizing an object entails several sub problems. The first problem as I said is basically taking primitive informations of color, shape, orientation, angle and those kind of uh, things and how to bind them together that is the first step. And the second step is to identifying the object. So, acquiring fundamental or primitive bits and pieces of information from the environment and assembling them together is what is the first step and this is called the binding problem. The second step in recognition is figuring out what an object actually is, what does the object actually look like. Now, fundamental information assembly starts with the binding problem, how activity in different parts of the brain corresponds to different primitives such as color, shape and combinations into coherent perceptions of an object. As I said these color, shape, angle, orientation these things are coded into different areas of the brain. So, once the sensory system is able to detect these things in an external object they send this information to different parts of the brain. So, there is a central area or a central processor in the brain which takes in these information from different parts of the brain and then creates a meaning out of it and how it makes the meaning that is what the binding problem is all about. So, the binding problem pre attentive and attentive process. So, this binding the idea of binding problem or the idea of how the brain takes in bits and pieces of information and integrates them together is called the binding problem how does it really work. At the core of it lies something called the feature detection theory. What does it say? It states that information from the world, visual world is pre-attentively encoded along separate dimensions which is shape, color and encoded separately and then integrated into a subsequent attentive processing stage. The first step that happens in terms of recognition, in terms of how uh, recognition happens is taking in this bits and pieces of information which has been encoded by the sensory system. Once the and this step is called the pre attentive stage. In the pre attentive stage, all information which is being encoded, all kinds of information about a stimuli which is in the external environment, which is encoded by uh, <coughs> the sensory organs, these are st and which have been stored together, they are first uh, brought together. And in the second stage, these sen sensory informations, these informations about the object are then clubbed together to make a whole and that is called the attentive stages. So, feature integration theory says that the perception of an object or the recognition of object has two parts. In the pre attentive stages, information is collected about different aspects of a stimuli and these aspects are primitive information. For example, color, shape, object, uh, object orientation, uh, object direction and an object height that kind of information. And in the attentive stage, these informations are combined together to form a whole to form an object or to form a uh, shape or, or for that matter any any kind of information bin. Now, the theory was proposed by Anna Trisman. The generalized idea is that the first in the pre-attentive 
uh, stage primitive features qualities such as shape and color are perceived and the second which is the attentive stage fo uh, focuses on attention properly glues together uh, the feature to form an integrative whole. So, as I said there are two steps in the first step you have something called the pre-attentive stage where you have basic information basic info of the external world which is recorded and in the attentive stage these basic informations so let let the informations be a1 a2 a3 a4 these information so a1 being shape a2 being color a3 being something else how they are integrated together to create a whole of whose meaning has to be generated now whether this is correct or not to test that let's do a little bit of an experiment now if i ask you to find me one problem or uh, one dev deviation on my uh, on my right or on the left of this board on the picture on the left of the board it will be very easy for you to find out and the answer is this one this figure is a deviant the reason being that most vertical bars are green in color and now you see a red green butter it is very easy for you to find the reason being that it is coded this is this this has only one bit of information uh, that is color and so as you can see color is a primitive information color is a very primitive information and so as as you scan through it a uh, red color vertical bar it actually uh, uh, excites you or it, it actually catches your attention because it has only one dimension that is the color and on basis of the color only it is very easy for you to identify the red color vertical bar look at the one on the right now, if I ask you one deviation, it is difficult for you because it has two bits of information here. It has color and it has shape. Now, the, uh, the <coughs> one deviation that is there is this, but it takes you longer time to identify it because here the shape which is different, the shape which is, uh, which is an outlier here is having two bits of information, one bit being the shape, the other being be the color. Now, since all of them are the same color, it is difficult for you to find this information because it is on the second dimension on the second uh, shape is the second primitive information. Here the first primitive information itself which is color is making you identify or helping you identify the, the outlier but here what happens is since all of them are the same shape or uh, same color it becomes really difficult or in same shape also it becomes really difficult for you to identify because the deviation is happening on two dimensions and <coughs> to prove that this theory is correct or the idea uh, the idea that we have actually looked at is correct I am going to use a kind of a uh, demonstration let us check if the demonstration really works yes it works and so what we are going to do is I am going to give you a quick demonstration now in this demonstration what you are going to do is to look at the center of after this screen the, you have to look at the center of the screen which has a plus and after that you will see four cars of four different models all you have to do is tell me what car is was what is the color of the car it was and what is the model so four colored cars are there and four models are there all you have to do is look at the center of the screen for uh, let's say 100 of a millisecond uh, uh, picture will appear in front of you which has four different cars on four different colors and uh, the, these cars also have models they are from a different models or different uh, companies and the logo since the car is in the front side you can also see the logo so let's see if you can identify the car color and match it up with the car uh, brand or the car company now well, let's do that quickly yeah okay what do you think let us do this one more time quick very quickly. So, here we are we start and what do you think? What will happen is most people will be able to identify correctly the color of the car and most people will also be able to identify the model of the car. But the problem happens in terms of binding. Now, since color and shape are primitive informations these that get encoded but if you say you see a blue color Audi or if you say you see a, <coughs> a red color Volkswagen you might be wrong let us go ahead and have a look at it right so it is a blue color Volkswagen it is a white color BMW it is a red color Audi and it is a uh, 
I, I, it's not a fiat but looks like a black color fiat and so that's what it is. So most people are able to tell you the type of car which is here and the color which is there but matching the color in car is a problem and I has just created that for you because this is the binding problem. What happens is people are able to very easily uh, recognize the primitive information which is color and shape but when binding them to particular colors binding to shape there is a problem and that is what the binding problem was what we were talking about. So the first step is the binding problem. The second step is figuring out what an object is. So how do we figure out what an object is in the recognition process. Now this problem has shape of an object playing a major role in the identification process. The process is a two part system. So how do we identify what an object is, what an object is in the external environment and that process starts by uh, focusing on something called the shape. Now there are two part process in identifying what an object is and so the first part is in the early stage the perceptual system uses information on the retina particularly variations of intensity and describes the object in terms of primitive components such as lines, angles and uh, edges. So the first step in identifying an object starts by looking at lines, angles and uh, uh, and edges. So the first step is that the retina itself, the human retina itself can pass off information uh, in terms of what is the line, what is the orientation, what is the angle of an object in the external environment. The first step is that happens. In the second step. In the later stage, the system compares the descriptions to that of the various categories of objects stored in the visual memory and select the best matches. So the retina, if we are using the visual system, it passes information about line, angles, edges, orientations, these kind of information are passed on to the, uh, to the brain and in the second stage, the brain uses this information, the binded information together and compares it or recognizes it or does something called pattern matching in which it compares what it sees from the sensory organs from the binded of sensory organ uh, information and compares it to all those pictures, all those object identifiers which it has saved with it in, in, uh, in some store and identifies what an object is. Relations among features, how does it do that? Now there is more to uh, the description of a shape than just its features. How do you identify a shape? What is the way in which shapes help you identify an object? So uh, the <coughs> description of shape is more than its features. The relation among various features are also be to be specified. So not only the shape of an object, not only how the object looks like or what is the shape of it helps you in identifying what an object is or in terms of pattern recognition. How does pattern recognition starts? It, it starts through the identifying what the shape is. So shape itself is not only uh, the reason or the idea through which objects are identified in the external environment, a step to it is how these shapes are or how these objects are related to each other. For example, look at this, this is a shape. So you have uh, a horizontal line and a vertical line and then you have shape B which is a diagonal line which is starting from the uh, left and coming down to the right. Now just looking at these two shapes does not create this shape there has to be an orientation. For example, if I take this shape and put this shape here, I will not get this. Or if I take the first shape and put an orientation like this, I will not get this shape. So what I am trying to emphasize is shapes are not the only way in which you can get what an object looks like or uh, recognize what an object looks like. A certain orientation is also necessary or relationship among, among features is also necessary. For example, look at this and look at this. If these two are together, if only this is placed at a particular angle, for example here will I get a shape like this, any other region I, I may not. This is one feature, this is another feature, integrate them together in the proper orientation I get this and similarly one feature, second feature, integrate them together in a particular angle and I get this. So it is not only the shapes, how the shapes are combined together, how the shapes are pressed together is how you will get the feature. So those were the early stages of recognition. Uh, now once an early idea of uh, object is made, once an early idea about what an object has been con uh, constructed, a later recognition model or a later recognition process starts. So later stage of recognition networks. So how does a, a, a recognition, so once you are able to identify basic uh, angles, lines, that kind of thing, primitive information is binded together to give you certain features and once these features and the relationship among features have been discussed, how do we do the recognition process or how is object recognition 
how does organization recognition pro progress? That happens through something called simple and complex network models. What is a simple? So, there are two types of models. One is called the simple network model and the other is called the argumented network model. And it, it, it borrows the argumented network model borrows some of the concepts from global versus local processing. What it says is that uh, the perception of an object uh, is more helpful when it is in context of something. And so, what we will do is we to understand the simple and the complex uh, network models, we will basically use the writing system, we will basically use letters to identify or to explain how does uh, object recognition or recognition process goes through. So, what is a simple network? Most researchers on the matching stage has used something called simple patterns specifically handwritten or printed letters or words now, uh, for explaining the simple network. The basic idea is that letters are described in terms of certain features and the knowledge about what features goes with what letter is a continued as a network of connections. I will just explain to you in a minute. Right and network with so the, uh, the simple networks the network with feedback are also called augmented network. How what does this uh, model says? A letter is easier to perceive when it is presented as a part of a word than when it is presented alone. Now this finding has led to the certain features in a simple network model or inclusion of certain feature uh, the, the uh, model. A, the level of word is added to a simple network and along uh, with it excitatory inhibitory connections that go now from letter to words and number 2, new additions of excitatory connections that go from words down to the letters and now added and these connections are easily explained by word superiority effect. So, these are the two additions which the augmented model or the feedback model have over the simple model. Let me explain this model to you. How does a simple model look like? So, suppose I have my primitive system or my sensory organ gives me the perception of this, this, this and this in the environment. It perceives that there are three lines, one a diagonal line which is ascending, another a diagonal line which is descending and third a, a vertical line and fourth a part of a curve. This is what the information that is sent by uh, the primitive system to us, right. Let us say that it has only these three informations given to us. Now, if these three informations are given to us or these four information are given to us, what kind of letters will be there if that is what it is. So, if the primary systems only tell us that there are two diagonal lines that is there one ascending to uh, uh, one descending and uh, one uh, vertical line which it can perceive and a curve part of the curve which is closed on uh, the right and open on the left, what kind of letters will be there. If you look into it, one possibility is k because k has and, and we have to see that maximum number of these uh, are combined together. So, what are the possibility? If you look into it, one possible letter is k because k has this diagonal line. It also has this diagonal line. Look at this. This is the ascending line. This is the descending line and it has this also. Right, and so if I combine this, 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 the possibility is this one possibility. Second possibility, if I look at this, this, and this, then I can get a R also. So if the, if there is a uh, if there is a form or shape which is a curve which is closed on one on the right side and open on the left side, the other things that I can get or the other letters that I can get is R and P. As you can look at, if I want to construct R, the presence of this is there, the presence of this, uh, the presence of this is there and the presence of these three features are there. So, if I combine these three features, I will get R. But if I do not combine this one, I will get this. So, a simple network model, the bottom level of the network contains the features which are ascending diagonal, descending diagonal, vertical line and the right facing curves. Now, the top level contains the letters and connections between the features and letter means that the feature is a part of the letter. Now, because the connections are excitatory, when the uh, feature is activated, the activation spreads through the letter. Now, <coughs> actually uh, this is a little bit uh, away from the simple network because simple networks do not talk about excitatory inhibitory connections. What are excitatory inhibitory connections? Excitatory connections are those connections or excitatory loops are those loops which says that the presence of certain features are there. Inhibitory connections says that the presence of certain features are not there. And so, in simple network, if k has to be found, then the presence of this is there. So, this is excitatory, this is there and this is there and this is inhibitory because this is not there. But for the presence of R or for the recognition of R, you have to have this, this and this and the presence of P 
is that you have to have this and this both of them are not needed and so how do we perceive letters we perceive letter in this way because this is the information which is sent out by the uh, sensory organs and <clears throat> this is what the perception are or this is how the interpretation is made in terms of the brain now this is a very simple model because the perception happens at only one level from down to up uh, this is what the sensation gives you so sensory organs sen sensory organs sends you these information and perceptual systems make this meaning. Let us take uh, a look at how augmented networks will actually look at. Now, augmented networks as I said in global processing what happens is not only bottom up processing, but top down processing also uh, goes through. So, it is easy to identify that this is a K or whether it is a K or not and if my sense organ sends this information, but also these words are also looked at. So, it is very easy to say that K is not the letter which can be formed by these words, right? The only letter that, that, that can happen or the only word that can happen, uh, that can happen if this is the top word and these are the information or, or, or these are the information which my sensory organs are sending me. So, my sensory organs send me that I am, I am viewing these four different things, right? Now, the letter has to be identified and my brain is saying that two, there are two words uh, pet and red, right? And you have to find out what is the letter which is there. So, assuming that these words are, uh, are there, these, these two possible words are there and these are the basic structures which my sensory organs are sending to you or send, uh, sending to the brain. You have to identify whether K is possible, R is possible or P is possible. Now, in terms of uh, in, in, in terms of the first word, the only possibility is R and that is why you are seeing. What you are seeing is that if it is R, you do not need this one, you need this one, you need this one and you need this one. So, this, this, this are present, this is a false input and that is why when you, when you look at from the top, this is a inhibitory connection which, which means that uh, it, it cannot, the K cannot be fit here because RKD is not a word and uh, the presence of this, this, this does make K, but then K cannot be present here and so the only possibility, the only letter which can happen with this, this, this and this or le uh, this, let us say this, this, this and this is the R word here and that is why you have the R word and that is why you have excitatory connection here. In case of this, what happens is that in, in terms of pet, the only possible word that can, gen, generate, that can be generated from this, this, this information which is coming from the sense organs and this information, the word information which is coming from the human memory is the letter P because it can only be P, E, T because any other thing P, K, T cannot be there, R, R, E, T cannot be there because those are non-words and so identification of words and so what happens here is that these are called feedback and feed forward connections. What happens is that information, <coughs> the uh, once, once the testing is done in terms of uh, in, ter in terms of the basic information, in terms of the basic information which is gathered from uh, the sense organs, but uh, the testing is also happening in terms of the uh, top information or the top down information which is coming from human memory. And based on that, when you when you look at the, from the from the sense organs we get uh, we get the information that this particular thing is present here but then when we verify this in terms of uh, the word you get a inhibitory connection we meaning that uh, this k cannot be fit here right similarly if i if i look at uh, this now in terms of k this is here but in terms of red k cannot be here but r in terms of r both you can get this that a b c so this 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 all included this is the only one which is not included and the top down process also says that the word is r here and not the k here so this is a feed forward, feed forward again feed uh, bat connection augmented connection and the other one is the simple network now very simply how do we understand that in one case what happens is that letters and angles which have been processed by the sensory organs, those are used for identifying letters, for identifying alphabets. In the other case, in the augmented network, what happens is that not only the information which is gathered from sensory organs, but also information, word information from the human memory are taken together, which is the context taken together and then the letter which is presented to you is identified 
as what it is. So, not only information from the sensory organs are taken, information from the human memory uh, which contains a lot of words which you have learned how they are integrated together to form uh, to form the idea of what word is being presented or what word it could possibly be. That is how recognition happens in terms of alphabets. Now, recognizing natural objects that is how and we recognize alphabets letters and so on and so forth how does natural object recognition happen uh, happen and the top down processing now features of natural objects it has been suggested that features of objects include a number of geometric forms such as arcs cylinders cones blocks and wedges now these features are referred to as geometric ions or geons and we are identified by someone called bidermen in 1987 what bidermen says is that natural objects are identified in terms of their basic ge uh, geometric ions now, Biedermann's proposal is that there are 36 geometric ions, basic shapes and it is the combination of these shapes that you get any object or that, that makes any object possible. Now, there are 36 geons that explain almost all shapes in any physical world. So, let us look into this. These are the basic shapes which are there. Now, I will <coughs> give you an example of how this th uh, thing really works. Look at these. These are the basic geons and when you combine this geon, so combine this with this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and if you combine this, you get a combining object uh, geon number 5 with geon number 3 and geon number 1, you get a telephone and in this case, combining geon 2, 3, 3, you get a torchlight In in case of this, you get a cup or you get something like this. It is very simple. Take a geon like this. Right, and this this is called a, uh, a a square zion. And in the square zion, if I put a semicircle zion, this become a shopping bag. But the same bag, if we take, or the same square we take, and if we put the zion in this angle, it becomes a cup. So basically, these orientations of zion, how these zions are related to each other in orientation, makes all possible uh, objects in the in the uh, natural world. Now, the importance of context, how does context actually make you identify objects in the natural world? Now, top down processing are driven by a person's knowledge, experience, attention and expectations. Now, these processing processes in addition to the geons, bottom up processing make up for the presence of perception in complex stimuli and physical environment. As I said, the global processing or the context in which an object is, the outline in which an object is makes you understand what an object is. For example, look at these, this figure. Now, if you start interpreting this figure, if you start seeing this figure in this way, it will, <coughs> you will start seeing a human face and then slowly, if you move this way and down here and this way, lastly, you will see a lady. But if you start from here, somewhere down the line, this lady who is crying actually becomes a human face. So, which way you start, the context in which you start, the way you start seeing things will decide what you are actually perceiving. Bottom up processing. These are also called feature analysis model. Now, we use features on the objects to build a perception. As I said, bottom up processing is basically about looking at an object. So, basically looking at lines, angles and things like that to make KP, idea of KP or anything for that matter, the basic geons on how they make something takes longer than top down processing and is more accurate. Top down processing, we perceive by filling the gaps in what we uh, sense. For example, if this is what we, you are looking at, so how do I fill this? Most people will quickly say that I want chocolate ice cream, right? So, bottom up processing looks like it says I want chocolate I ice cream and that is how you fill in because this word is there somewhere in your head or in, in your uh, a mind. Now, based on our experiences and schemas, so this, uh, basically your past experiences or the schemas actually make you make interpretations and so this is what bottom up processing is all about. If you see many old men in glasses, you are more apt to uh, process the picture of an old man even when you may be in error. So, if this is what it is, if you have seen an old man it uh, or you, are, you know old people there, this does not become a rat because this, this is, seems like a rat here. But then if you have seen old men uh, before or if you have seen too many old men, it seems like a old man. So, it does not seem like a rat here. Quickly moving on. 
So that's about recognition of how we recognize objects. The next two processes in perception is abstraction and constancy. What is abstraction? Abstraction is the process of reducing the vast amount of information that comes in from the physical world through our senses to a more manageable set of categories. Whenever any information comes to us from the physical world, what we try to do is we try to abstract, we try to uh, break it into uh, manageable quantities and that is what is the process of abstraction. For example, when we look at a human face, what, what is it that we actually gather from it? We do not gather the whole face, we just gather certain markers of the face because the idea of how the human face looks like, it has two eyes, one nose, this is already abstracted, this is already stored in the, in the, in the brain. What the brain actually captures when you see a new face is certain uh, inequalities or certain peculiarities that the particular face that you are looking at is having and that is matched up to any face which is there and based on that is how it looks like perception and that is what is abstraction. So, for example, look at this. These are uh, two set of uh, pictures which were created and what does abstraction actually do? Abstraction actually helps us in, in uh, simplifying object perception. So, if you look at two objects, one, one is a hand drawn picture of a face and the other is a picture which has been drawn by a computer. Now, both the picture actually shows surprise, a kind of a surprise which is there, but you will be amazed to know that this picture requires almost 3020 KB and this picture requires 920 KB of disk space for saving. Now, for the same what has happened is you are abstracted here, if you look into it what has happened is here the eyes, the nose, the mouth and the face has been abstracted with certain geometrical forms and these geometrical forms actually require a uh, less mass storage, but this figure requires more. So, abstraction is a process of through which what you tend to do is look at external information which is in, in front of you and from there you extract information which is required and delete information which is not required because every time you see a chair you do not have to remember a chair. The brain knows what a chair looks like and so when you see a new chair all it has to do is to find out how it is a chair or how this chair is different from the one or different from the concept of a chair or the prototype of a chair which is so stored in your uh, head. And to uh, look at whether abstraction works or not, uh, Carmichael did a small experiment in which what he did was he gave certain stimulus figures to two group of people. So, these are the stimulus figures that he gave to two group of people. Then after that once he showed these figures to people, to two group of people, so this was group 1 and this was my group 2 and what he did was he gave these verbal labels to these figures, right. One group saw this figure and they got this verbal label or got this name curtains in a window right and this group was told that it is a diamond in a rectangle. Later on after some days these groups were called back and they were asked to uh, draw reproduce the figure that they saw. Now, people who saw curtains in a window they drew this, but people who saw diamond in a ring they drew this. Similarly, people who thought that this was 7 or said this was 7 drew this, but people who said uh, people who were said that it is 4 drew this. Similarly, people who were said this is a sun drew this and sheep will drew this, which basically says that what label is given to you or how uh, things are uh, explained to you that decides how we abstract information. People do not store images or people do not store the idea about uh, any in, in, in image in the external information. What they do is they abstract, they take away all necessary information which helps them identifying objects and store it away and that process is called abstraction. So, that is what abstraction is all about. And the last step or the last step in this process is called constancy. What is constancy? Constancy is maintaining a certain uh, uh, certain relationships to of objects in relation to one another. What is constancy? So, a remarkable ability or the perceptual system is to maintain something called constancy, which refers to the brain's ability to maintain a perception of the underlying physical characteristics of an object such as shape, size, color, even when the sensory manifestations of these objects change uh, drastically. For example, think about a friend of yours who is coming from far away or who is approaching to you from a distance. Now, a friend who is approaching to you from a distance obviously he is of a certain at a certain distance let us say he is at a distance of 20 meters. Now, if it is there the shape his shape which falls on the retina will be very small. Now, as he approaches closer and closer to you his shape on the retina goes on increasing bigger and bigger, but the question is 
do you think your friend is changing the shape? No, most people do not think that the friend is changing the shape whether he is far away or whether he is near to you and this is basically what is called constancy. This is what is the idea about what is called constancy or look at this. Assume that this is a door on a hinge, this is a handle. Now, when I take this door and when I try opening it, this door becomes like this on a hinge, right? This is the handle and when the door has totally opened, this is what the door looks like. So, 1, 2, 3, this is the direction of movement of the door and now the door looks like. Now, this case the shape that is falling on your retina is a rectangle. In this case, the shape that is falling on your retina is a trapezoid and in this case, the shape that is falling on your retina is a straight line. But in all these cases, the door still appears to be a door or you maintain this constancy, maintain this idea that the door is still a door. It does not change shape, does not change, uh, change shape or does not change, change the fact that this is uh, a door. There are several type of constancies that the human brain actually maintains. Let us look at some of these constancies one by one. Color and brightness constancy, what is this? Color constancy, it is the ability or the visual system to perceive the reflectance characteristics of an inherent property of an object no matter what the source wavelength is. Now, when let us say I have a particular color, I have a uh, red color uh, book. Now, when I take this red color book and I go inside a room which has an incandescent bulb. Now, the incandescent bulb will is called the source of source wavelength or it produces the source wavelength source of the illumination and the uh, so this is called the source of illumination and the object the red color uh, book which reflects or colors of light from the source is, is, uh, is uh, supposed to be having something called reflectance wavelength or reflectance characteristic. Now, when I take this book and go into a dark room which, which has an incandescent bulb or a room which has an incandescent bulb, the reflectance that the book is doing of all the light particles, photon particles which is coming from the bulb is different from when I take this book into a bright sunlight and then I actually see the book. Right? So, when I see the book in bright sunlight, the reflectant characteristics or the wavelength which is reflected by the book will be entirely different. But no matter what, wherever I go the book appears red to me and this is called the brightness constancy or this is called the color constancy. Similarly, there is something called the brightness constancy. If there is a white color uh, cat and you see it in a dark room, it is more whiter, but if it is a black color rat or the same white color rat in a white room will appear to be lesser or dimmer. Now, this idea that the white color rat is still white whether it is in a dark room or a bright room, the idea of this is what is called the idea of color constancy. Brightness constancy refers to the fact that the perceived lightness of a particular object changes very little if at all even when the intensity of the source changes drastically. Color and brightness constancies depend on the relationship among the intensities of the light reflected from the different objects. Same girl, two different backgrounds. So, whether this girl looks more brighter here than this one. Most people will not see this uh, happening because a constancy is maintained. Two different uh, uh, the same color object is there at the background and two different filters are used. You will not see a different because certain shape, color constancy and brightness constancy are maintained. Shape constancy, similar to color and brightness constancy is the idea of shape constancy. What does it say? It refers to the ability of the perceptual system to maintain shapes of objects in external environment. Similarly, there is something called size constancy, it is the ability of the perceptual system to maintain the object's perceived size relatively constant no matter how far away it is. So, door whether it is this way, whether it is opening, whether it is this, it appears door to you and similarly, this is what? A trapezoid is no matter how you move it, it is still a box, right? So, here it is, it is not that this is more of a box and this is less of a box when you change the angle, what happens is the box still remains a box. And so, constancy is that property which is proposed or which is uh, possessed by the brain so that it is able to see all orientations or it is able to see certain fixed idea about objects. This is an illusion. 
Now, how does it sometimes these constants is also responsible for illusion? Now, look at this. If you look at these two people, right here and here, and the idea of illusion is also another wonderful feature of this maintaining constancies. If you look at it, this person looks smaller than this person. Although, if you measure this and this person is the same. Now, the architecture of this room is made in such a way using binocular, uh, monocular and binocular cues that this person here appears smaller and here it appears bigger if, and the idea is that since there are lines which are going here and so that constancy is maintained that idea is maintained in your head and so you believe that this person is smaller than this is this is actually a illusion right so this is uh, what we actually keep on doing and this is how the idea of constancy actually works right so these illusions are also part of the business of constancy so what we did in today's lecture is we looked at the three different processes which we left off in the first section or in the first set of lectures now perception not only starts with attention and localizing it also has a process of something called uh, recognition and as I discussed in this lecture this recognition starts with something called global versus local processing the next step in recognition is something called the binding problem where it has to be identified what stimulus is coming from the sense organs and how they have to be captured together or glued together if there is a problem on in gluing you come to note that and that is called illusory correlation so all those people who are able to tell the color of the car and the shape of the car but not the color car which color card is which brand they are falling prey to something called illusory correlation the next step is basically recognizing object and that happens in terms of recognizing the shape of an object this is the primitive form of uh, recognition this is called the first stage recognition in the second stage recognition you have later recognition models certain models uh, which are called simple and or uh, augmented models now simple model says that and these simple and augmented models generally work in terms of uh, letter perceptions and so simple network models actually say that certain line angles and uh, certain lines angles orientations are what uh, are used and these certain line angles and orientations they integrate together to give you the perception of particular letters and shapes the argumented model says that it is easy to perceive a shape it is easy to perceive a letter when it when not only the basic idea of about lines and angles are there also you know the fact that when this letter is possible or in which uh, word this letter is possible so if you have both this piece of information of what word can contain this letter and what uh, uh, basic uh, forms or what basic angles and orientations is the sensory organ sending to you these two information combined together it makes it easier for you to identify angles similar to perception letters perception of natural objects are there and the idea is that there are certain gaons and these gaons they combine together to give you an idea of how letters and uh, how natural objects are perceived so that's about recognition or that's how, how about recognition really goes uh, goes through or the process of recognition really grows through then we have the idea about something called abstraction what is the process of abstraction when we recognize an object we abstract information or we extract information from it those information which it has different from the prototype or the mm, uh, idea or the concept of anything that is as for example if i'm seeing a face the brain already knows what a face looks like it has two eyes one nose so each time you see a face you don't have to capture this information all you have to capture is what is the one thing which is different and so it captures that and it stores it on the background of the face which is there only the brain has to know whether it is a female and male female or male and what kind of peculiar feature that i'm looking at takes this information binds it to information which has already been stored in the brain and then how this is how you recognize faces so this is abstraction which is basically taking in information then there is a process of constancy which helps in recognition or which helps in uh, perception constancy uh, says that there are certain things there are certain facts which the brain preserves for example heights of people don't change when they move uh, towards or away from you also sort perception of colors don't change perception of shapes don't change because if they change then the world around us will be ininterpretable and so you have these constancies or you have these ideas of making constants into in, uh, embedded into your brain and that is how what the brain actually uses for making information possible or for making understanding possible so 
In this lecture, we completed what we did in the last lecture and explained the idea of how perception really works. If you are really interested, there are other lectures on cognitive psychology which I have floated which will in detail explain to you these network models, these connectivity models and this idea of how recognition takes place. So, if you are interested, you can view those lectures or uh, in the internet there, there are these lectures of cognitive psychology which are another course which I took. So, you can focus on those courses which will detail to you this process. Now, since this is an introductory lecture or introduction uh, lecture, I am not focusing too much on to how this perceptions or recognition actually happens. But as I have as been telling, if you are interested, you can refer back to those lectures in cognitive psychology where the part, idea of what perception is explained in detail. For here, for an introductory process, this is the minimum that you need to know of how object perception or perception of any form actually takes place. So, until we meet next, it is goodbye from here. 